Good evening. So thank you so much for the invitation for the opportunity to speak on this topic. Um, we know that this is on the forefront of a number of people's minds, um, and this is an issue that affects all of us. And so I'm grateful for the opportunity to talk a little bit about the city landscape and also a little bit about what the city is doing and where we think a public health approach has the most potential to be effective. So I wanted to show this to kind of put it in the national context, which Dr. Rexing just did, specifically the fact that this is an issue that the whole country is grappling with at the moment. And these are some of the headlines from the last year or so outlining how critical the gun violence issue remains. Um, but the one that I wanted to draw your attention to, if you go back one um, is one from our own Philadelphia Inquirer outlining that at a point in time, um, victims of gun violence were more common than patients with heart attacks in one of our local emergency departments. And so um, uh, the sense of urgency that we all feel about this, I think, is warranted. So one of the ways that we attempt to measure the impact of um, firearm violence on our city is to try to actually provide publicly available data on where we're seeing injury. So we launched, launched an injury prevention dashboard in February of this year aimed at specifically providing data um, around gun violence and where we're seeing it, who it's affecting, things that we all know, but we often really never had a central resource to describe. And that's all in the name of having a more data-driven approach more broadly. Um, so what we did on our, on our dashboard is we actually started with the social determinants of health. And that was a very intentional decision because we believe that there's a foundational aspect to what is going on in the communities where we see recurrent um, high levels of violence. There are other things that are true about those communities. And if we're going to take um, the, the approach that Dr. Rexing outlined, which specifically focuses on the health impact pyramid and the need to focus on the base of that pyramid to really substantively change public health issues, ultimately we need to think about the social determinants. And so this is just one of the examples and what it demonstrates is um, how poverty overlaps with shooting victims in location, just geolocates in similar locations in Philadelphia. And this is true for a number of other social determinants like employment or the presence of opportunity youth um, or educational attainment. And so we need to think a little bit more about what is driving these issues and what's true about the locations in which we're seeing high numbers of shootings before we're able to affect the problem. So this is just another way of looking at that same issue, focusing on one particular um, item, which is unemployment, specifically what's defined as chronic male unemployment. So unemployment in, in individuals 16 to 64 who are males, and this is defined, chronic is defined as no employment in the preceding 12 months. And what you can see here is that these things, again, co-locate with violence. And so the regions of the city where, th where both of these things are high, where there are both high numbers of individuals who um, have been chronically unemployed and there are high numbers of shootings overlap. And so the question I think public health has to ask itself is how do we start to go downstream and really think about what's creating these, these systems of, of disadvantage and how that's manifesting as violence rather than waiting until violence occurs to respond. So this is also from our dashboard. And what this demonstrates is, is a little bit of what we've been seeing over the last few years. And so this is data through just August of this year. Uh, and October has been, when you look at it through October, which is the most recent time that we've pulled it, you can see that the trends have been fairly similar. What's notable about this is that um, cumulative numbers in 2019 and in 2020 started off different. So 2020 started in January, worse than the preceding January. But however, as you can see that the effects of the pandemic started to take place. So after March, um, as the pandemic itself and its after effects really started to take hold, those lines became widely divergent. And that's where you really start to see violence took off. And then January of 2021, we really started off in a significantly worse place and for the most part maintained that trend. Where we are now is that we're um, close to the highest number of homicides that we've seen in reported history in Philadelphia. Certainly we haven't seen um, greater than 500 since I think 1990 or the early 1990s. So it has been a very long time since we've seen these numbers and that's overall homicides, not just firearm homicides, but many of you are aware, firearms drive the majority of homicides in, in Philadelphia. Um, and so ultimately, Ultimately, this is just an overall uh, view of kind of where, where we've been and how things kind of took a turn for the worse right when the pandemic started to take hold. I also wanted to draw your attention um, to the figure on the bottom right, which shows the kind of stark and really disturbing racial disparity that we know is associated with firearm violence in our city. So we know that there's a disparity nationwide when it comes specifically to homicides. We know that there's an issue around um, how this problem has been described and managed in the past and what tools have been used um, to, to address it. Um, but overwhelmingly, the victims of uh, shootings in Philadelphia, this is non-fatal and fatal 
uh, incidents are non-Hispanic Black individuals by a lot. And so there, this is definitely a racial equity issue as well. And it, we need to address the degree to which racism itself is a public health issue and it manifests as exacerbating all these other public health issues. So this is just showing the same disparity looking at rates in particular. And so whether you're looking at non-fatal shootings, which is the figure on the left, or homicides, which is the figure on the right, both of those are, are have market disparities. And non-Hispanic Black males overwhelmingly um, see this particular public health problem more than any other group. So this is looking at another aspect of, of, of um, firearm injury. And it's worth noting this particular aspect, especially in the current context. So we all know that emergency departments have been very heavily burdened in the setting of COVID-19. We also know that there are a number of other health issues that we expected to worsen as people avoided medical settings in the context of COVID and as medical services became less available to communities that already had um, a decreased availability to medical resources. And so this just shows you what um, what emergency department visits have looked like specific to firearm related injuries in the past several years. And in 2020, in the exact same time frame that we saw shootings go up in general, we saw ER visits also go up with some month to month variability. Um, 2021 has been a little bit more stable, um, but we continue to see that overall there's a significant burden um, on our local emergency departments. And that has significant implications for the management of other diseases, for resource utilization, for the types of resources that are available to these individuals upon leaving the emergency department, et cetera. And it also has, um, to put a positive spin on it, it also has implications for um, preventative options and ways that we can at least do some secondary and tertiary prevention to prevent subsequent re-injuries um, and also significant mental health effects for people who are victims of firearm violence. So I wanted to draw out just a couple of populations to talk about because I, there has been a lot of conversation, I think, around both women and children and the increase in violence in those populations. It's worth noting that there is no... Um, there's no population for whom this, this is acceptable. Um, but I do wanna note that we're seeing changes in what types of violence are occurring. And we're seeing that those seem to have been affected by the pandemic as well. So if you look at um, shooting incidents among women in Philadelphia, similarly, a couple months after the pandemic took hold as the public health measures and necessary public health measures to control the pandemic were put in place, you can see that there was an uptick in violence against women specifically around sh um, shooting incidents and that that elevation has been maintained in the current year. You can see similar trends for children. So that diversion of the lines in children occurred much sooner um, in 2020, but you can see that that's again been maintained in 2021. And so ultimately, I think this really speaks to the need to really go further down the line and think about the core preventative strategies that would empower communities where violence occurs at, at at high levels, um, because the manifestation is really very broad. But we are seeing also that the nature of violence is changing, and that requires, I think, new and innovative strategies to, to solve it. I wanted to take a moment to speak about the lasting harm that we anticipate that this is doing in our communities. And there um, are those who are coming after me who will speak much more to this. But um, here in Philadelphia, there's been some work done to look at how this is manifesting both in children and adults. Um, and one of the things that's really notable, I'll start by talking about a national trend Nationally, it was noted that mental health related visits for children in particular, the percentage of them or the proportion of them that were mental health related went up. In other words, kids in general were not going to ER visits as much during the pandemic, the per but the percent of ER visits that were mental health related went up in that time period by a significant amount. Um, and that I think goes hand in hand with the next piece of data, which is that living near shooting incidents in Philadelphia, this research was done in Philadelphia, increases mental health ED visits for both children and adults. And so, you know, we focus on the people who are killed and the people who are injured and we need to do that. But there are significant ripple effects and those are also relevant to the cause of public health. And so we need to talk about the full universe of, of compromised health that is, that is generated by firearm injury um, when we talk about this problem. What I just mentioned is also linked to general health. So one of the things that we often advise patients in my, with my other hat on is we tell them that they should be engaging in physical activity for a number of health benefits that that's associated with. 
But what these maps show are incidents or, or zip codes that have high numbers of individuals that were shot near a public space. And so specifically victims that are shot within one city block of a school rec center or park by zip code in 2019 is what's shown on the left. And this probably looks familiar because when I showed you the social determinants map and the general kind of shooting victims map, these are the same zip codes. So these are places where residents are reporting low levels of access to safe outdoor spaces. So that may be in part because of violence, um, but you can imagine how that would affect health much more broadly, right? We know that physical activity and engagement with social, with neighbors and the development of social cohesion has significant benefits outside of just, you know, preserving one's, one's health and well-being from violence. And so if we are not um, promoting safe spaces, there are other effects of that that we need to be cognizant of. So I really love this image. This comes from the Bay Area Regional Health and Equities Initiative. And I think it really speaks to what we believe needs to happen as, as far as a public health approach to violence prevention. So I think historically, clinical medicine has absolutely been kind of on the right end of the spectrum. We focus on the disease and injury and we treat it. And sometimes we talk about the risk behavior. So sometimes we're kind of one rung up where we're going a little bit more proximal and thinking about what might have been, what risk behaviors might have been informing that disease and injury. But rare Early in clinical medicine, until I think recently, certainly in my training, have we really thought about the far left portion of this diagram, the social inequities that inform the institutional inequities, that inform the living conditions, that inform the risk behaviors that ultimately lead to the health conditions that we're treating. I think the same transformation is both necessary and, and happening in the world of public health, where we focused on the problem and maybe we've done a little bit of, of um, you know, public service announcement work around risk behaviors, but haven't necessarily thought about how we need to transform the institutions and think about the social inequities. It's understandable because that's harder work, but I think gun violence is a great way to kind of draw attention to the need for moving to the left of this diagram. If we wanna see change that can outlast the next pandemic and the next social stressor. So the public health framework is one that we're trying to apply to the city's work. And this is an example of something that we're trying to construct. We're trying to take the work that the city is doing in various sectors and in various agencies and plug it into an established kind of public health framework that helps us know where are we concentrating our efforts. And the goal, of course, is to concentrate as many of our efforts as possible in the pre-event space before anyone has gotten injured. What are the factors that we can mitigate so that injury doesn't happen? But we also need to make sure that we have adequate resources at the time of these events and after these events to respond to people who are affected by them. And so taking the work that the city is doing and reorienting ourselves to look at it this way is one of the roles that my program is trying to play to make sure that we're oriented around um, the values of public health. So this is just a, a brief summary of our work areas. And for the purposes of time, I'm not gonna dive deep into all of the things that we are hoping to work on. I'm happy to answer questions about that. But I think that ultimately um, a reorientation around a public health framework for addressing violence and its after effects is the kind of core value of our program and somewhere that the city is, um, is actively moving into. And I'm happy to take questions about that. Thank you so much.